Welcome. Good afternoon for those in Hawaii. Good evening for those on the West Coast or on the continent. And whatever your time zone may be, thanks so much for coming to join us at Think Tech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. And we have the extreme good fortune today of having with us four truly exceptional women leaders, respected and appreciated for all that they contribute, uh, both professionally and personally. And in no particular order, I'll start with Louise Ng, one of our most respected attorneys and an advocate for women's rights here for many years, very successfully one of the progenitors and creators and founders of the Hawaii Women's Legal Foundation and many of the activities that it has brought to help serve the community and many others. Sandra Sims, retired judge, author, community service leader, and just all around really good person and friend as well. Tina Patterson, over on the other coast in Germantown, New Jersey, mediator, arbitrator, business and strategy coach, and another leader that we look up to and forward to hearing from. And Rebecca Ratliff, long a leader in the insurance industry and now in conflict resolution as a mediator, as an arbitrator. All of these leaders have considerable experience in negotiating under extremely difficult and adverse circumstances, including gender and other biases. So starting with that, hey, I ask each of you to recall a situation in which you encountered gender or other bias or combined biases, and you had to figure out ways to deal with it effectively. Rebecca, you want to start us off? I will. Uh, I was, <laughs> as you were saying that, I, um, yeah, I was thinking about my 30 year career in insurance, um, really for actively 25 years. Um, back 30 years ago, there weren't very many people in, in the commercial insurance space that looked like me. And um, there were many times when uh, I was microaggressed. We now uh, put a term, we've, we've put a term on it, and there's three classifications of my microaggressions, um, one being micro, uh, micro assaults and then micro insults and micro invalidations. Um, and there, there were probably micro insults almost daily uh, because what we know now is that uh, we all have implicit bias, but those biases enable behaviors. And so bias in and of itself um, is, you know, is not bad, but the behaviors that, um, that come from those biases are, are what we see and what we're hearing about now. We're having conversations now very openly about um, these microaggressions and different behaviors that affect um, the advancement or lack of advancement for women and people of color. And um, there were, I mean, maybe somebody uh, would touch my hair without, that's a micro assault. Somebody actually touches my hair without permission, really usually kind of innocently out of curiosity maybe. Um, and I was always gracious, um, you know, back coming up through um, through my career. But but now it's more acceptable to actually say, you know, if you had asked me, I would have said yes. If you'd asked me if you could touch my hair, I would have said yes. Um, and and you know, when people do things unintentionally, when they offend you unintentionally, you don't want to hurt them back. That's not um, the point. You really are trying to. You want you would prefer to teach usually. Um, and so, you know, now, though, that we are having these conversations about different things that um, have happened in uh, the careers of, of, of women and um, I'll say women and people of color, but people in other categories that are uh, underserved or uh, or seem to be seem to feel invisible still, um, then, you know, these conversations can be had and, and information can be brought to the forefront so that everybody can consider how to address these, these behaviors and everybody can live equitably. Mm -hmm. So how do you distinguish between, when you encounter that, between an inadvertent manifestation of what hopefully is increasingly becoming unacceptable bias and treatment and something that's more harmful, more 
disrespectful, more divisive and mm -hmm. than that. I can recall an incident that I think will reflect some of that, Chuck. Um, this was during my time on the bench and I was presiding over, you know, I'm a criminal court judge at this point, I'm presiding over a criminal proceeding. And the attorneys, um, we were doing jury selection and the defendant was not, was not African-American. In fact, no one, none of the parties, the attorneys, prosecutor, defense, or any of those. And we're doing jury selection and at one point in the jury selection process, you know, we ask people if they have particular reasons why they um, may have a, you know, some personal reason why they can't participate. And I would usually hold those sessions at the bench to not have people have to say out loud something that was sensitive or, or personal. So we, this, this gentleman came, asked to come to the bench to state his reasons. And this is what, what you were talking about. And he says, he wanted to be excused from the jury in this case because he did not like black people. Now keep in mind, I'm the only black person there. And, he, I mean, and you're that the he judge. was emboldened enough to actually say that to the judge presiding of the case, I don't like black, black people. And I said, that's got nothing to do with this case. Um, so that's not a reason to be excused. Uh, so I told him he could sit back down and he remained there for the rest of the day. And uh, when he was called into the, um, he actually did get called, um, you know, into the, into the uh, uh, area. And um, the attorneys didn't even ask him any questions uh, while he was in the jury box. They were, didn't even address anything to him. They just asked that he be, you know, that he just be bumped and he was. But it was, I, 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 it, it, it was glaring to me, first off, in that the person felt emboldened enough to just say to the only Black woman in the room, who happens to be the judge, that I just don't like Black people. Um, and I just, you know, that's not an, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I just, that's not an issue in this case. <laughs> that's, sorry, <laughs> sit down. But I think um, and, and, and of course, at that point, I'm having the, you know, sort of the judicial shield of not getting, you know, confronted with a lot of other things, but that just sort of, I just, you know, some people just, yeah, you, you're just so emboldened. And I think we've seen way more of that in the last, uh, you know, in the last four or five years where people are just bold and emblazoned with their, you know, overt expressions of racism. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was the first experience that came to my mind and it sort of addressed that sort of subtle, actually wasn't subtle, but. And, and that's an important point we've seen, and we're still seeing it encouraged at the leadership mm -hmm. level. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tina, Louise, your experiences, your insights. Please, you're muted. <laughs> I know. I was just, oh, so is Tina. Um, anyway, you, you know, I was just thinking about that. And I would say as a lawyer, I don't, maybe I've suppressed it. I don't remember any overt racism or sexism. Um, maybe, you know, maybe there's sort of micro aggressions in the sense of, I would say the most common thing when I was a young lawyer was being mistaken for a secretary or a paralegal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure everybody has had that experience yes. and you kind of let it roll off your back, but you roll your eyes and you just think, oh my God. Um, and it does, I think it, it has the, you know, sort of the unconscious effect of sort of in, in, reinforcing that idea that of imposter syndrome, you know, I don't quite feel like I belong. Yeah. And I would say that a lot of maybe the experience of a woman and a young lawyer um, when I was coming out is there, you know, there were growing numbers of women, but still not a whole lot. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes you'd be in a conference or a meeting and it would both mostly be men and mostly white men. And, um, you know, I think it was just that feeling of not quite feeling like you belong. That was, you know, more of the sense. And I also would say that when you say combination, the thing I remember too, is just being a young lawyer and young lawyers just, you know, seeming to have the, bully me sign. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
so it's hard to separate out, you know, what yeah. was woman, short Asian, and just being a young lawyer. I have to laugh because I, you know, just one of the lawyers that I remember of just really dreading every time I had to deal with him as a young lawyer, because he, you know, was clearly far more experienced and would make it clear he was, is that I just got a Facebook friend request from him. <laughs> it was decades later. I know who you're talking about. Oh. <laughs> And even the even the uh, initials, DD, right? So, hey, Tina, your experiences, your perspective. Oh goodness, uh, Chuck, that's a very that's a very interesting question. I'm I'm going to share my experience as um, an arbitrator um, because I think it's it t- ties to the second part of your question, which is how you handle it. Um, Early on in my career, I had explored getting involved in construction arbitration, and I attended a training um, at an institution for a week, and I I realized I was the only woman in the class, and I was the only person of color in the class, and we were placed in cohorts of eight to ten people, and my cohort and I were seated at the lunch, lunch table, and gentleman seated next to me said, proudly and loudly, I don't know any women in construction arbitration except for secretaries. And the silence at the table was deafening. And I continued eating. I could see everyone else suddenly look like they had a bad case of heartburn. And I just looked at them. I said, well, that's about to change. And I continued eating. And much like you, Louise, you know, there was a part of me that wanted to roll my eyes and say, really, you're actually saying this at the table. Um, but I continued on with the class. Um, the word got around about his comment, not from me, but from some of my other mm-hmm. male colleagues mm-hmm. who would come to, to the side and tell me, you know, I'm so sorry you said that. And I thought, well, you could have said something at the table, but you didn't. You know, I paid for this class just like everyone else, and I'm going to persevere. Um, long story short, at the end of the class, the gentleman came back to me and apologized. He said, you know, I... I was wrong. Um, I think you will do well in in this sector. If there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. And this again is where I, looking back now, it it had been nothing more than being dignified. I thanked him and I thought to myself, never. (laughs) I'm not certain who else you said this to or done this to, but I'm not going to, I can't take you up on that offer. I don't know if, you know, if you're, the hand that you're extending to me also has a snake in it. So, um, so to your question, part of it is um, being as dignified as you can be, exercising discernment. Um, would it have been the best place for me to have a meltdown? Absolutely not. My career mm-hmm. was at stake. And also for me, um, because I was mid-career in doing this, and I had come from information technology background. It wasn't my first time being in a male dominated environment, but it was the first time someone was bold enough to actually make the statement to me at the table. And I thought, wow, you really, you really feel comfortable. And again, other people at the table were deadly silent. Um, You know, they, they didn't know exactly what to say, but the words were out there and couldn't be taken back. I think you make an incredible point, Tina, in that women have to learn how to get what you came for. Sometimes, you know, you mentioned it wasn't the place or the time to break down. What good would that do? What you do is, I I like being uh, underestimated. I've spent my entire career around, uh, you know, um, in in, uh, industries where it was mostly white males. And um, my decision is to be emotionally intelligent, just like you were, and to to get what I came for. Nobody is going to scare me away. I've done the work. Um, do I sometimes have to gear up when I'm going into a room? Absolutely, Louise, to your point. Um, sometimes uh, people act- actively try to make you feel as if you don't belong, but I know that I belong in this space, and i um, you just you you do have to know what you bring to the table. You have to know who you are, and um, when your credentials or or your um, heart's nerve and sinew are called into question, you have to make a decision. And and my decision is that I'm going to get what I came for. 
That's an and excellent you, point. I like, I like that approach. It. Go ahead, Sandra. Sorry. I like that approach that, you know, you're, you're, I like that approach, Rebecca. Yes. Yes. We do belong in that space. And I think that's a, that, that sense of, of that sense of sometimes getting that feeling that you don't belong, I think is a common thing from women that we're going, well, it's particularly in these professions that are predominantly, you know, that are male dominated. But again, there is, we would not, not any of us would have come into these places without the preparation, without the determination to proceed. And so, yes, we hear those things, we see those things, those things happen. But I think each of us in our, our time, we're in different generations as well, but we each dealt with that, know that's what we had to deal with, and we moved on. I, I recall a funny instance when um, I first started working at the Corporation Consul's office here in Honolulu. Now, um, and I was, this, you know, in, the, in the, the way it's set up, you're assigned to different departments as the attorney for that particular department. And I remember the first time I was called into to a meeting with the uh, building department. This is like the, you know, the city's engineers who asked for someone from Corporation Council's office to come. And I'm thinking, you know, you walk into this room <laughs> and, but these aren't all, all white guys, but they're, you know, Japanese and uh, it's Hawaii is different. But so it's an, they're all men. They're, yeah, it's, it's all, all men. I walk in and I'm thinking, oh boy, am I, am I, is someone gonna go and make certain that she knows what she's talking about? And I remember uh, Herb Muraoka, he's since passed away. And he looked at me and he says, are you from Corp Console? I'm like, yes. He's like, all right, here, this is the problem. <laughs> you know, so it was like the whole, like, oh, okay. I don't have to prove who I am or establish or be in that place of having to establish and confirm that I am here and I belong here. It's like, they had a problem <laughs> as far as they were concerned. We didn't really care what you look like, please. We have a problem. And of course, you guys know working with the cities, there are often many, many problems. And so they're really more concerned about problem solving than what you look like. <laughs> but that's kind of a comical one, but I share. And what you folks have all done is exhibited two things. One, <clears throat> a level of awareness and the ability to pick up on those biases and those behaviors and attitudes in ways that gave you back the choice as to how you decided to respond or react. And you chose to respond or react in a way that showed exactly what you just said, which is that you belong there and you know it and you're gonna conduct yourself in a way that manifests both of those things. So now that we're seeing women in leadership, hopefully increasingly in political leadership, in C-suite business leadership, in academic leadership, we have 28 black women law school deans for the first time in history. Yes. What does it take to get there? Lines like you, Chuck. Chuck, <laughs> you you are a person who will speak up in situations where um, the average person would be uncomfortable in speaking up. You're willing to be uncomfortable for the good of all, and and, and it's going to take that. Um, when um, Sandra was Sandra was talking, I thought it's worse when women try to make you feel like you don't belong. Because we we've been kind of talking about you know, being in spaces where, you know, men are the dominant culture. <laughs> and um, there, there are also situations where women will try uh, to make you feel as if you don't belong. And that's even yes. worse. And so it, it, takes, um, it, it takes us to stick together and stand together and do good work. I'm, I'm a builder. And so um, everybody on this, <laughs> on this program knows I'm a builder. And so the way I um, the, the attitude that I take is uh, to, to multiply and not divide. And so when you find other people who feel that way and have that philosophy and understand that there's enough for everybody, then we can all win together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it takes allies and sisters. I mean, Chuck, allies like you. Um, well, you know, and regardless of race, 
gender and the like, but people who are willing to support other people. And then, um, although you credited me kindly for being a founder of Hawaii Women Lawyers, I was not, but I was an early member. And I think just having that sisterhood of lawyers, some slightly senior than me and, and others along the way was just very empowering and a great support too. That's probably how I met Sandra. I'm sure that's how I met Sandra. Yeah, it is to Hawaii Women Lawyers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is how we first met. I remember, yeah. With right. uh, Sherry and... Uh, yes, uh, the founders. Yeah, yes. the people who were yes. the founders. Sherry Broder and... Um, Ray St. Jude. Yeah. 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 Ray St. Jude, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, we go back a long time. Yeah. And I think also just um, being emotionally intelligent, as um, was it Rebecca or, or Tina who mentioned that? Um, I think back for, and, you know, what you say about women sort of sometimes being our, our most, uh, uh, I guess, uh, da daunting foes. I remember being as a fairly young attorney in Japan and, you know, mostly dealing with men and male attorneys there. There was one woman on the other side and everybody considered her a dragon lady. And um, I was afraid of her too, but then I'm thinking, you know, just to be empathetic. I mean, she probably had to claw her way to the top. No wonder she had to be mean. Uh, you know, maybe in a different age, we might have mm -hmm. been able to build uh, a more of a bridge. Yeah. yeah. And you hit on it exactly. And I'd be the first to acknowledge that anything I've learned about respecting and appreciating strong, independent, progressive, insightful women in leadership came from my mom, who was a small town, Northern Louisiana woman who exhibited all of those qualities and was our example as a single mom and as a professional woman. It's given me an advantage, a belief in that, a receptiveness to that, a commitment to that. It's just, mm -hmm. it becomes part of who you are. And I think you've all hit on it exactly, especially Rebecca. Allyship is a verb. It is an active yes. verb and it needs yes. to come from the heart and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that heart and spirit need to come from who we are as a person, culturally, historically, traditionally. And I think the other thing that I'd be remiss not to point out is that having gotten to know these four truly exceptional women pretty well over recent years, I can tell you completely honestly, no matter how high an opinion you may have of each of them, you are underestimating them. I guarantee you that. Whatever you think you see and perceive there is more, and the more you know them, the more you find out about them, the more you will find to respect and admire. Hey, and I think each of you has shown that you've taken situations where somebody brought unacceptably offensive and demeaning attitudes and behaviors to the front, and you exhibited exactly the opposite behaviors and attitudes and gave people a place where to go. And the response to that was people who came to you and expressed their thanks and appreciation for reminding them, this is how people treat each other. Mm -hmm. So what can women in leadership do now that can help make that model more pervasive in our society, as divided as we are? some people and become, uh, I'm saying become, all of us on this program are mentors. Um, <laughs> yeah, but be a mentor, look for opportunities to serve because uh, sowing good seed, you reap good seed and you meet people who, um, you know, you didn't expect to meet and you get opportunities you didn't expect to get because of your willingness to sow into people. And I um, I, I have mentors, even at this point in my career, uh, I have a panel of mentors. Some people refer to them as their personal board of directors, but I, I have mentors <laughs> who don't interact with each other, 
um, but they serve different purposes for me. And I certainly make myself available to, um, to be a mentor because the next generation needs to know what we know um, and they, they need to be encouraged and, and um, pushed. Sometimes we get behind them and push and you can dream for them beyond their capacity to dream for themselves. And, and that's what we wanna see is more confident professionals in the future. Exactly, exactly. I'd say tell the story. And I, and I agree with everything that Rebecca has said, mm-hmm. but tell the story because when we, we see those who've gone before us or we see our peers, there's, there's that per- public persona and then there's that private personal persona and life. And sometimes they're one and the same, but oftentimes it's the wear and tear of the demands of being a public official or being in front of parties that we need that time to connect with others. And so while we talk about the the forward facing, we also need to talk about the need to have the support, the allyship. And sometimes that circle of confidence that you can literally say, I'm exhausted, I, I need a break, or right now, I've got three things pulling on me and I don't know which one to do first. So that you can, after you've talked with that, that circle, go back to that public persona and, and do what you need to do. I mean, that, that is, that's an integral part of leadership is, is refreshing and recharging. And I don't necessarily mean taking a vacation, but I, it, it could be that, mm-hmm. but it could also be me picking up the phone and saying to Rebecca, Rebecca, I'm experiencing imposter syndrome. And she says, tell me what's going on. Yeah. That's you, sis. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yes. That is beautiful. Absolutely. And to have that is, 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 is really awesome. I mean, one of the things I think about too is, um, you know, gratitude for yes. those who've paved the way before. Absolutely. I mean, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit older and, uh, I remember, you know, when I started law when I started law school in the early 70s, there weren't that many women, you know, in the law school. When I everything I've kind of done, you kind of went in and there was hardly anybody there, but that you could, you know, look to. But when I, you know, look at the history and study what, you know, what women lawyers or women in other professions who were in the, you know, like in the 40s and 50s and and even before then you know, went through to get, to get, to accomplish what they did. They knew, like you, Rebecca, they knew what they came there for and they made a path. And I, I, I just am forever grateful for those incredible women who left this way that we can kind of move into and like you say, prepare the next generation and, you know, be those mentors. And, uh, you know, I have, I have, you know, two daughters who are in professions and, my youngest is in engineering and she's always telling me these, reminding me now of things that I did as a parent. They kind of, sometimes it's a little bit shocking, but kind of nice to, to hear that back because she's in those circles where, you know, even in law now we have, you know, a good number of women in the field, but in engineering, they're still not. And uh, so she's taking that uh, sense that you re- mentioned, Rebecca, of, I belong here. I know what I'm doing. I'm supposed to be here. And she's okay with that. Not in a, you know, she doesn't have to be, a, you know, bludgeoned with a hammer or anything, but she knows her stuff because that's what we as, you know, as mentors and the role models have prepared this generation to do. That's what we got from, you know, the women who went before us. And so I think it's gratitude right now. Gratitude. I think it's also awareness. <laughs> that we are being watched. Um, you know, we were kind of slogging through life, just trying to do our thing and not realizing that people are looking for at us. And so I've tried to be even more positive and act like I'm having fun because, you know, who's going to want to be a leader or a partner if they look like you're just dying and it's yeah. been a slog and it's, it's much more enjoyable if you can have a, create a positive experience from, working with each other too. What a great place to end today's session. We're out of time, but thank you all for joining us. There will be more of these 
wonderful, inspiring, enlightening experiences and people. And we hope we'll come back and you'll come back in two weeks and rejoin us again. Thank you all so much. Aloha. Thanks for giving Aloha. us the forum. Thanks, Chuck. This Thank was you. great. Chuck. Thank you, Chuck.